Welcome everyone to another workshop for Beyond Extent. I'm Timothy Dries and I'll be hosting this workshop with Simon Verstraate, who is going to lead us into the magical world of Houdini and going to kind of give us like a nice introduction to like the, the basics for artists, right? And with all that said, I'll hand it over to Simon. Yeah, thanks Timothy. <laughs> Great to be here. So let's get started. Um, so we'll do like small presentation first, um, Houdini basics for artists, and then I will do sort of like a live demo building a few things to, to show you some of the basics. Um, so yeah, so I'm again, I'm Simon Verstraete, and a little bit about me is I studied digital arts entertainment. Uh, it's the same school that Timothy went as well. I did the game graphics courses, so focusing on making uh, making cool things in game. And the last year of the studies, uh, you have the graduation work, and I researched Houdini. So it was the first time I heard or used Houdini, um, and it really stuck with me. I pretty much liked how things were uh, different in Houdini than compared to how you would uh, learn something from school. So I kept learning Houdini, and for my first job at the indie studio, Exxon, uh, I also uh, used Houdini there. So they used Houdini to build uh, parts of their game. Also in my spare time and my free time, I also did research on Houdini. How do I build something in Houdini? How do I use, you use facts or use a bit more complicated things with Houdini? And also I started making tutorials in my spare time. So almost three years ago, uh, I actually made my first tutorial. Uh, from there, I've been making a few uh, of them here and there. I also did some uh, blog posting as well. And at a certain point, I got in contact with Side Effect, and we then sort of like uh, work together. And now I'm also working together with them uh, to make new tutorials, learning content, things like that. So that's currently what I'm sort of doing. Uh, you can also go to my art station page. Um, there's a variety of Houdini stuff there as well. Uh, I mainly focus more on the environment side of things, uh, like how to generate a rock, a building, also something like how to use edge damaging tools to have like a more procedural workflow. So these are some of the things you can also see there if you're interested to see a bit more about Houdini stuff. So a few things I will show you here today. So uh, I'm going to go with the beginning, what is Houdini, just like a very uh, basic understanding. Then I will show you a few examples of Houdini being used in the game industry. And I'm also going to then spend the rest of my time, of most of my time I want to spend into like a live demo. So first of all, what is Houdini? So you can say that this is a, that this is a 3D software package. Um, you can say it's like similar to other software like uh, Maya, Max, Blender, Mudo. You can do similar things. You can do 3D modeling, animation, rigging, simulations, explosions. Most of these software have have some form of approaches for that. Now Houdini, there are a few special things with it. Um, Houdini by itself is actually quite known already in the movie industry. It's used a lot for doing complicated smoke, fluids, explosions. If you would watch a movie, there is a high chance if they use an, any kind of explosion or fluids that Houdini was involved in that. So another thing that Houdini uh, makes a bit special is uh, the node-based approach. So whatever you do, you need to actually build a node for that. So if I want to make this basic shape here on, on the right, um, you need to have a node for that. So let's start out with, with the box. So if I place a box in my 3D viewport, I will need to have a node representing that box. That box, of course, has properties, so I can change the scale, uh, change the rotation, change the divisions, and so on. But I will we'll show you more of that later. So when you build a node network, for example, I do a box, then I do an extrusion, then I do bevel, I can have a basic shape like that. But now it's like, why would we create these node-based node, node -based structures? Uh, and that is because we want to create something a bit more procedurally. We want to make a non-destructive way of working. So from that same setup that I had here, so from these three nodes, I can now almost instantly uh, get variation. I can make the box larger, I can make the box smaller, 
I can squeeze the box in different shapes and sizes, and my network will adapt to it. So the extrusion will still be on the top, the bevel will still be on the edges, things like that. So this, for example, could also be the start of a building tool. Uh, like you could see like a very rough building shape in there. So we could use that to build something out of it. So that's why Houdini is very interesting. It's because the procedural approaches and the non-destructive non way of working. Uh, also importantly to mention is Houdini Engine. Uh, this is a plugin that allows us to take a tool into uh, Unreal or Unity. So here's a quick demo of that. That's something that I made a while ago. So we just place boxes. And from these boxes, you will then be able to then define a house shape. Uh, so for example, now I'm defining where the roof should be. I'm just speeding this up, of course. And in a moment, I will grab my Houdini tool. I will assign the boxes to my Houdini tool. And the Houdini tool in the background calculates and outputs the final result that we want. So it's just actually placing modular assets. So it's placing the modular wall, uh, modular uh, parts for the roof or pipes. So it's doing that all in the background. So the designer who, who is sort of like making the house is just placing boxes. Uh, and just by changing the boxes, he can always go back and forward uh, between different results. So that's why it's quite interesting to have uh, Houdini engine or to use something like that to speed up those processes. Now a few industry examples. So I'm going to show three. And there, of course, are way more examples out there like uh, like a lot of the bigger AAA studios are interested in using uh, Houdini, but I will show you a few of them here. So a very classic example or a well-known example is the Far Cry 5 World Generator. Uh, this is from a talk from Etienne. So Far Cry 5 itself is a open world game. Uh, it involves a lot of terrain, a lot of forest. So how can we recreate that faster? So this is, of course, using Houdini with procedural logics. So it generates the terrain, then it generates where can trees where can trees grow, where can certain rocks or other foliage be. So this is all done by Houdini. So if I take apart a uh, slide of, of his uh, presentation, you can, for example, see that we calculate interesting data uh, from the terrain. You could see like a little bit like Substance Painter, for example, where we would also calculate the curvature or calculate a certain mask or uh, another type of map to generate something. So we're going to do a bit similar here, where we're going to try to generate interesting masks, and these masks define where certain effect needs to happen. So I'm going to try to define where the trees can be or where the rocks can be. So that's sort of how you can see these things. Another example is then uh, Spider-Man from a GDC talk. So this is also a AAA open world game, and uh, this time it's in a city. So of course, uh, they build a city generating tools. So they can block out very basic shapes, how the city needs to be. And from that, the tool will do a base pass on that by placing all of the modular models, placing some basic assets on, on the roofs and things like that. So the main idea here is that the tool uh, sort of like does 70 to 80% of the work, and then still like 20% is done in a more manual way. And often this is the reason because we want to still bring or tell a certain uh, certain story. Uh, like the tool, if it's not necessarily built to tell a story, it will not output that data. Uh, so often like we want to have like a specific quest on a rooftop, we still have an artist like finalizing and really telling that story in there. So the artists want to spend their time where it's most useful. So the tool just generates where every window needs to be. So the artists don't have to take care of placing every single window or placing every single door by hand. They just have this base layer to work on top of uh, instead of having to do build each building from scratch. Another example is the Ascent from Neon Giant. Now, the previous examples were uh, bigger AAA studios. So Spider-Man, Far Cry, those are bigger studios. Within, with the Ascent, this is from a smaller studio. So they also leverage Houdini in uh, their advantage to build things faster. So for example, if you look at one of their environments, it looks really stunning, nice, beautiful. And there is, of course, Houdini involved. Like when we talk about the cables or the complexity in some areas, they are generated by Houdini. So 
instead of having artists trying to manually figure out how something would go or something would look, they just have some Houdini tools in place that can already generate the base layers of that. So they don't have to place every single asset, don't have to place every single cable. They just have tools in place that can generate that. They did not only build tools for building environments, but they also used the power of uh, the simulation options in Houdini for destruction, for example. If, like you see here, like the spaceship that crashed in the building, so they actually built a system for that in Houdini and exported that into the game. So Houdini is quite useful for that as well. So those were some basic introductions to Houdini and also some examples. But now I actually want to go into like a live demo, show you a few things here and there. I uh, hope you learned something from it. And also you don't need any Houdini license. Uh, you have the Houdini apprentice version, which is completely free. You can try it out. Uh, it's more meant as a learning version to just get started. Uh, there are, of course, limitations like you cannot just uh, export uh, every model and you can also not just render because there will be uh, there will be some trademarks on it. So there are some things, of course, that the free version uh, has limits into. But you cannot use all the nodes that Houdini offers. That's no problem. So at this stage, if there are like any questions you have, I can already maybe answer one of them. Yep, Polygon is uh, asking some really good questions in, in the chat as well. Um, the the first one there is procedural generation seems really powerful. Like I'm considering introducing a module on procedural content creation for games to our degree program. Are there any resources you could point me towards to learn more about it? Um, maybe maybe some of the top of your head, and then maybe after the talk we can compile like a little list of stuff that comes to you, and we can add that to this this chat. That would be would be great. Yeah. Um... That's it's definitely a good question. Um, well, what I like is the side effects website has actually like a collection of all kinds of tutorials, uh, not only from themselves, but also from other creators. So that might be like a great way to just like browse some interesting tutorials. It also depends on what exactly do you want to teach. I think it's uh, good to define what do I want to uh, teach, like do I for pretty folks do I purely want to focus, for example, on world building with terrains, or do I want to focus a bit more on, uh, on like smaller tools to generate rocks, or maybe some utility tools to do edge damaging? So you can have some different branches in there. Um, yeah, like probably smaller tools is always most commonly good start. Uh, if I also look how I started with Houdini, it's also was more about making like a small tool and try to go from there. Um, but personally for me, I, I followed things that I found interesting to build and that were the tutorials I followed. Um, I would also recommend you like, yeah, if you see tutorials that uses, for example, a lot of like programming or VAX, then I would probably say like, yeah, wait with that because you don't need that for a beginner. It's definitely not useful at the beginning. Um, so I would say try to keep those things more basic. Um, yeah, maybe afterwards I can uh, elaborate a bit more if, if you want to. Um, maybe another question. Yeah, sure. So, um, um, yeah, the next question from, from Polygon as well is like, are there any performance overheads in using procedural generation at runtime within a game engine? Yeah, uh, so Houdini, if you talk specifically about Houdini and Houdini engine, this is all baked out data. Um, this is not really running real time in game. It's mainly to, for example, like, yeah, I generated my building or a tree. I'm just going to click the bake button and the bake button basically saves that current version you have in your viewport as a static mesh or, or as a blueprint. For example, if you do instancing, it will just save as a blueprint. Um, so there is not necessarily uh, any performance because if it's uses if it just saves out to a blueprint or static mesh then it's just like another static mesh you have available cool 
Um, and then we also have a question from Scott Burns. Um, does the Apprentice version allow tools to be used in Unreal Engine 4? Um, yeah, the Apprentice version is um, does not fully support the Houdini engine. So you will need to have an indie license or higher. Um, I would like, I would recommend starting out with the Apprentice version, try to just understand Houdini. I also just started with that version. Uh, and if you're really interested in doing more stuff about it, then an indie license can be really interesting. Uh, you can also get one on Steam if you're interested in that. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for the questions already. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to show a few things in Houdini. I will try to start. Very basic. Um, I will first of all make like a small pipe tool, um, and then I will might uh, show some other things uh, based on the time. So let's start simple. First of all, we have our uh, interface. So this is my 3D viewport. Uh, you can click in it. I would often hold the Alt key and then click and hold the middle mouse to pen. And of course, we can scroll. So those are some basic navigations. Uh, we also here on the side have things for rotation, uh, moving. We also have snapping. Uh, we have some options here as well, but I might use uh, in a moment some of them. Then here we have our uh, parameter properties, and then we of course have our node network here. So those are the main things. Uh, if you open Houdini, it will probably more look like this because I'd like to close some of the tabs here you have. So you can just close them. I sometimes would even close this as well. And with the P key, I can have a pop-up menu on the side. Um, so yeah, let's place our first notes. So we're going to press tab and then we can type in what we want. So if I want a box, I just type in box and I have a box here. So this is my notes and we'll output a box. So you can see the box here. Uh, I can have the uh, property. So again, with the P, uh, key, we can open and close this. I often use this because it's quite flexible to uh, have here. So we have properties to scale, rotate. There are some other things we can do here. And one of the first things to understand here is we need to understand in what context we are currently working in. So currently I'm on an object level. So this is mainly where I have my multiple objects. When I want to edit this box, let's say I want to do an extrusion. You need to go into like an editing mode, uh, like you would also have in other uh, softwares. Like you have your object level, then you press uh, certain editing modes to actually do a certain extrusion about. So in this case, we actually just double click on the node, and we will see here our box node. And now we are in a geometry level. So that's one of the first things that you need to understand is this is an object level, and this is geometry level. Why do we need to understand this? Is because we have a lot of different nodes here. Let's say I want to do an unwrapping. I have, for example, some unwrap nodes. If I want to do an unwrapping over here, we don't have that because this is just object stuff. Um, so we can actually now here start to edit the geometry. So now we have our box. We also have some uh, other parameters here available. Um, we can also do the scale. We can do some divisions if you want to. And let's say uh, I want to also include, uh, for example, a sphere. So let's say I want to add a sphere. So I'm going to just press tab, add sphere. But now my sphere is not really in the scene. And that is because the rendering icon. So the blue flag or icon here is what is currently seen as output. So if I change this to this node, we will now see that sphere. So that's just when, whenever the blue icon is on some node, it will be seen as output. So next question is obviously like, how do I bring those two together in my viewport? And we can just simply merge results. So merging both here, and this is then my new output. So of course, if I press W for wireframe, uh, they are just inside each other. I can, for example, go back to my sphere. I can just click on it. And if I press the handle here, which is the main handle of Houdini, uh, you will probably see like this red cage and handle. So now I can move this up 
or I can just quickly stretch this shape into anything that I want. So we can play a bit with shapes here, as you can see. I can make like a very basic block out of a model or try to already experiment with some procedural approaches here. But these are just some basics understanding here. So whenever the blue flag is on something, that's our output. It might also work to sometimes just click a note to preview, like you could see. You can just click on a note to edit them as well. Uh, also, for, useful to know is we can also just do a boolean as well. Uh, I really like the boolean of Houdini. It works really well. So we just boolean those two shapes. So we're going to subtract them from each other. I uh, can just scale it. Oh, I have rotating here. So I can just start to playing around with this. So we can just play around with these things. So again, if I'm not happy with the sphere here, I can just grab another shape. Uh, Houdini again, like we are not really the, working in a destructive way. I can just start to tweak things. If I, for example, need more divisions, I can just type in, I need more divisions. And now I have just more topology here. So those were a few basics to understand. Um, now let's already start with that pipe tool. So in this case, I can actually just delete what I have here. doesn't matter that much. Uh, I'm just going to quickly open this one. So I'm going to make a very basic pipe tool. And the first step is creating the shape. So we'll just draw a curve. And then I will do a sweep around that. Very basic. And I will just uh, tell you how we can do that. So first step is drawing a curve. Uh, we can again just press tab, type in curve, and we place the curve node. So the curve node had some changes recently. If you would look at older videos, you will see a different type of curve. Um, so here we can just have this red dot. If you don't have the red dot, that means that you're not on this uh, handle. For example, here I don't have this red dot because I need to be on this handle. So it's important to understand that often I would be on this handle when I do something in Houdini. So I can now just click and draw a line. So as you can see, this is also now a Bezier curve. But for my pipe tool, it's not really useful to have actually a Bezier curve. So I'm going to go and hit the reset operations. So it's just deleting my result. And I'm going to go and switch this from Bezier to Polygon. And now when I draw my curve, I should have just like a basic line, nothing special, just the basic line. Uh, when I press enter, I sort of like finish off my operation. And what I can also do here is also, for example, I could uh, have enabled the grid snapping. So when I now click, uh, you will see that I can actually snap on the grid nicely. So it can also be useful to, uh, to have. I'm just going to maybe just click reset and draw something simple like this. Doesn't matter that much how your pipe looks. It can be a shape like this. And press enter when you're done. So this is the first step. I have a basic line. Uh, if I want to edit the line, I also need to go into editing mode, which can either be done here, or you can also click on this button, editing mode. And I can just quickly edit the points. So further, um, let's already, for example, do a sweep. We can plug in the sweep. We can define the shape. It currently doesn't know what to do, so we need to define uh, a round tube, and it will output this round tube shape. We can here increase the amount of polygons used to, for example, 24. And we can also increase the radius if you want to, based on how large you would have drawn your curve, you can play around with this radius. Now, what I also want is that these corners are like perfect 90 degrees. So let's try to smoothen them out a bit. So we can use the bevel node for this. We can here, before we do the sweep, bevel the points. So if I type in beveling, we have poly bevel, and I can bevel here the points. 
So if I now go to distance, it's not doing anything. So the bevel node by default, it actually works mainly with primitive and edges. It doesn't necessarily work with a shape or a line. So we need to tell this bevel node that, hey, you need to work on the point type. We're going to switch this to points. And now you can actually see beveling. So for example, we can say 0 0.15, for example. So with that, uh, we can go and increase this to also a higher division, for example, 8. So we have a nice smooth curve. And if I go back to my sweep node, I now have like nice curved uh, corners here. So that's the first step. If we also already talk about UVing and unwrapping, this is like one step away from us. We just have to click Compute UV and it's done. Uh, if I view my UVs here, we can see it's properly done. Uh, we can also use the quick shading node if you want to quickly view a texture. Uh, you can just quick shade that. And you can see that this has a nice consistent UV without too much stretching going on. If I quickly go to UV view, it just looks like this. So that's the first part. So already just with three notes, I can have something usable. Then the next part is, if I go back here, is we need to define uh, these points. And what I want with these points is I want to sort of like copy a ring model on them. So on each point, I want to copy like a ring uh, shape, sort of like for a supporting structure. So that's sort of like what I want to do next. So how can I get these points? So we basically need to define where the bevel is and we need to delete those parts. So let me go back to Houdini. So I will start from the curve again. And I will basically copy paste or hold the Alt key on my bevel. Then we can just grab a copy. And when I reduce this amount of divisions to one, we just have like one single line. So there's one single line, I want to delete that. Because it's, it's sort of like interfering with when I want to copy that uh, circle shape, the ring shape. So what we want to do is we want to cut that line in multiple pieces. Uh, so whenever we have like a point, we want to cut that line into pieces. So we can also view information about this geometry. So each point in Houdini has a number. You can just view that here. This might often be useful if you want to do more procedural things. If you want to double check numbers, you can check that. In this case, I want to double check the primitive number. And what we can see is that we only have primitive number zero. So now I actually want to break up each line into its own primitive. We can do this by the carve node. So click on the carve node. And we're going to enable first and second U. And we're going to say it goes from zero to one. Otherwise, it will, as you can see, it will sort of like carve or cut apart from your curve. So like I said, we want to break this cable into pieces. So we're going to enable breaking points and enable break uh, U points. And now if you look closely, we can see that we have a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So these are all numbers created by it. What we can see is that the odd number is always in this corner. So this is the beveling part. So now I want to make a certain logic that selects always the odd number. And there is a node for that, which is called the range, the group range. In this node, if I open it here, we have a range filter. So when we select one of one, we will get the same result. When I start to fill in two here, we will now have this result. So we're selecting one out of two primitives. And we can also do a small offset here. And now we are selecting uh, those parts. So now we actually have that odd number. So this might be useful if, again, if you see a certain pattern in the numbers, 
then a group range might be useful to sort of like filter out based on those numbers, like you see here in this case. So what we want to do is, prop, first of all, give this a name. So this is the final name uh, that, will be, that will be passed on into other nodes. So let's give this a name, for example, odd uh, number or odd group. You can choose for that, it doesn't matter. Just make sure it's consistency and uh, make sure it's like understandable. And then we want to delete that part. Uh, you can, for example, use the delete nodes in Houdini. There are a few of them, uh, but I often would prefer using the blasting nodes, which is very easy to use. So the blast node, we just say, click on this icon, and then we see our alt number available. And as you can see, it's deleting that part. So this system is just automatically taking care of that and deleting those parts. So we're almost there. Uh, the only thing left to do is to actually have a model to copy on these parts. So we're going to spawn in a tube, for example. So we have a tube here. And in the tube, I can say close caps. So it's like fully closed shape. Uh, the height should probably be quite small, like so. Maybe the radius as well. We can always go back and forward. And I want to now have this tube model copied on uh, the points here. So in Houdini, we would often do something which is called copy to points. Uh, I use this often. Uh, so here we have copy to points. But since we are working with lines and curves, we want to do copy to curves, which is a bit more useful and advanced when we are working with curves. I will show you the difference in a moment. So we have copy to curves. So when I plug this in, it's automatically copying that shape on the curves. Now it's not necessarily following the ring, it's not necessarily following my curves. It's like need to be rotated. And I can just go to my tube and say orientation mode to, for example, be the Z axis. And now I actually have the correct orientation here, as you can see. Now my tube is still a bit large, so we're gonna go to the radius, make that smaller, and then it's like better in scale. Then to finally to preview this, we want to merge these two together. So merge the base pipe with the ring here. And now we have that available. So we have these rings whenever we have like a corner piece. So quickly going back to the copy to curving. So usually I would use copy to points. Uh, so if I do copy to points, you can see that the orientation is almost going nowhere. Like it's just uh, aiming for the same direction. So they all of them just faces in this direction. So the copy to curves actually calculates how the curve is orientated and it will copy the model along that curve. So by default, copy to points doesn't have that. And you would actually need to build a system or a logic for orientation. Uh, so you can actually look into how they did it here. Um, you can see they also just use copy to points. But for now, it doesn't matter that much. I just want to give you uh, some of that knowledge there to understand how these things work. So just going to delete this. So we have our base. Uh, pipe here. So I can go back to my curve, uh, make sure you are in editing mode. I can grab, for example, a point here again, and I can uh, redirect that. I can play around with this. You can make it like so. You can have like a very basic pipe system. So let's say I want like more of the rings going on. We can quickly add that now. So we have our base logic. Now it's sort of like adding features on top of that. So let's say we want to have more of these rings. So for each point, we will have a ring. So if I add the amount of points, we will add the amount of rings. So we can use, for example, which is called a resampling. Resample will add points. So you can see that for each point, we will now have a ring here. So we can play around with that. So maybe. Something like this. 
and that we have like more supporting structures around that pipe. Uh, also quickly, I forgot to mention is you probably want to use like a proper model than just a tube. Uh, you can use your own files or FPX uh, by just using the file node. So in the file node, uh, you're going to just get, get the path to your FPX file. Uh, just get that file and then you just, instead of using this tube, you just plug in then your own file and then it will work as well. Then you can use your own models. So it's not always necessarily about I use Houdini, I need to do everything in Houdini. You can still make your modular assets in whatever software you prefer, but in Houdini you can write a logic to automatically place them uh, so you don't have to uh, automatic so you don't have to manually place them uh, in your game engine or, or in your scene. So we are almost done here, and one of the things I still want to do here is let's say the beveling here uh, is getting increased. So we have the bevel here. Let's say we increase this. Uh, we can see that my ring logic is not working anymore. So as you remembered, we copied the bevel node to the other side, but it's still holding this old value. Now in Houdini, we can link uh, values to each other, which is very useful. So what we can do is we can now click on the bevel and we can just say right click and I want to copy this parameter. So this will actually get a reference to this parameter. We're just not copying this value. Uh, we're actually getting some of the logic behind it. And we're gonna now go to our other node. We can remove this if you want to. We can right click and we're gonna say, make a reference or paste a reference of that node. So now we have that here. And you can see that now it's updated as well. So we have the same spacing or beveling uh, consistently along this pipe. If you dive a little bit deeper in this, you can see that there is now a certain logic in here. This is a small line of code, and this is referencing to the bevel node. So as you can see here, we are saying to this node, for this value of distance, look for the polybevel node one, which is of course this node, and look for the value offset, uh, which is of course represented by uh, the distance here. So in the background, distance is actually called uh, offset. So that's the actual naming of this parameter. And then we sort of like here, if you click on the name, you have the same value. So now I can play around with that. So I don't have to worry too much about it. And you can do that with other values in this network as well. Um, so for example, if I would scale up my pipe here, I'm not scaling my rings. So what I can do is I can, again, uh, copy uh, this parameter and I can link it, for example, to the radius here. Uh, so these are some of the things you can do, like link values together to make sure everything works better together. Uh, so that's, that's, I would say, is actually the first step of working more procedurally, is making sure you have like a, one value that can be used in different parts to make sure that everything is like scaling or working properly. Um, so yeah, so this is the first uh, demo that I want to show you. This is also again, like I said, one of my first tools that I even made. Um, so with the system, you can expand on this. You can uh, build other stuff on this as well. So I can see that there are a few questions, so maybe I can uh, check them out here. Uh, so from Timothy, instead of referencing copying values, can we not root the first polybevel to the carve node? Uh, uh, no, and because um, we use different uh, amounts of divisions. So if I, for example, plug in this over here, my logic is not holding up anymore. Um, oh, if I go here, yeah. So you can see that the group range node, uh, it will now be selecting those parts as well because we had that beveling here. So if I go back to my here, so now we are selecting this full part here because this only had like one polygon and this one had eight of them. 
so my knowledge of my grouping doesn't work anymore. So that's why uh, we do that separately. Of course, there are like tons of different ways on how you could approach things. There is no good or bad way. Um, so that's just how uh, you could do it here. Uh, then another question. Can you talk a bit more about uh, Houdini engine integration? Is it possible for you to showcase uh, how you say this pipe into Houdini and bring it into real? Um, yeah, I can talk a bit more about that. Um, maybe I can do it uh, afterwards. Uh, I want to show like one more demo. And maybe afterwards I can uh, go, go talk a little bit quickly about uh, how we can get that in game engine. It doesn't take that much actually more work to bring this in game. Um, like it can quickly be done in like a minute or so. Uh, but I just want to move on to the next demo then and go from there then. So I'm going to go into the, another demo. I'm going to go back to object level. I can rename to, for example, to uh, pipe demo, something like that. And now I want to talk a bit about cloud simulation. So Houdini is known for simulation stuff like destruction, explosions, fluids. Also cloud stuff is also quite popular. So I want to show a bit about that. So what I want to do is I want to just spawn a basic plane and then let it fall on a certain object. So we start out by placing a grid. And we're just going to again open the grid. And in here, we can, we are on geometry, so we can edit this geometry. We now want to build a solver or a certain simulation logic. So we are actually only two nodes away from building the simulation. First step is we need to say what kind of cloth this is. Uh, so if I press tab and type in, for example, vellum, uh, we can have uh, multiple vellum options. So vellum is actually the name of cloth simulation. So what we want is we want to configure our cloth. So in this case, I want to use um, just a normal cloth. You can do other stuff like hair or balloons. Um, we can just do basic cloth here. So we have this configuration node. Uh, you plug in your geometry. Then you can see it might get some weird wireframes or constraints. And the other node that I need is the actual solver or the simulation node. So if we type in solver, we can see multiple solvers for pyro or other stuff. So we're going to grab the vellum solving. So we need to connect these nodes. So there are three dots in this case. But if you press the J key on your keyboard, uh, we can hold J and then just connect those quickly. Uh, that's just like a quick tip. You can just manually connect them as well. Doesn't matter that much. Uh, and then we can go into solving. Uh, of course, I need my timeline here, so make sure your uh, timeline is here available. And when we press play, we should have a cloth falling down. So that's the first step here. Maybe I want to hide my grid here. So here you can quickly hide your grid if you want that. So that's like the first step. So the cloth is just like falling into the ground. Nothing really special. So we need to define a collision object. And it's pretty easy to do. Um, so we can grab an object. I'm going to use the classic test geometry, the pick head. So we're going to place that over here. You can see it's colliding with my grid. Um, sometimes I want to probably like maybe reset viewport. Yep. So we don't see that plane anymore. It was like a small issue here. And we want to just plug this in into the third object, which is collision geometry. So my plane is actually still uh, intersecting. So it's probably a good idea to move this up like so. Uh, we can also scale this probably down because the cloth doesn't need to be that large. Uh, so yeah, that looks good. So we have these things. And we are now in simulation. Sometimes you might need to hit a reset uh, because simulation is cached. Uh, so you can actually play it back faster. So we have now the simulation. 
So the blue part here means that the data is cached and you can play it back without having to calculate it. So we have this result. Now, there are two things that bother me. Um, so it's quite low poly. It doesn't really appear to, to look like a nice clot. It's pretty low. And it's also gliding off really fast. Like It just like glides off for no reason. So let's fix that. First of all, we want to add a bit more uh, topology or wireframes. So if I look into my grid, if I press W, you can see the wireframe. Uh, we can here increase the rows and columns. But we probably want to do a bit more yeah, procedural way or automatic way. And we can just use the remeshing. So we can just remesh this. And then we have like a result like this. Uh, we can also go into remeshing size here. And if we play around with this, we can see that we can have more or less uh, polygons. So this is a quick way to then uh, have a higher quality. So don't go too low with this. Don't suddenly make this like one or two million polygons because of course the simulation needs to calculate this. Uh, so make it something like this, like around 1,000, 5,000. If you really want something higher quality, then of course you need to bump this up. Uh, but for now, uh, let's just play it again. So here's the system. You can always hit reset if you want to. And let's press play. And as you can see, like this is now actually looking more like a collot. Looks way better. We can still maybe increase it a bit more. So we can always go back. We can say, for example, 0.5. And then replay again. And then we have like that extra geometry, just as you can see, like helps a lot with adding more and more detail. So then we have that. So also, like my code is also sticking pretty well to my model. Uh, but in case, let's say I want to move my plane uh, to this side, for example, and I re-simulate, uh, it will probably just glide off almost. Yeah, it will just start to gliding off. So this looks pretty nice, but let's say I don't want that much gliding going on. So in our network, we're going to go, so this is the solver simulation options. We're going to go to forces. And in here, we're going to go to our friction option and we're going to increase our friction of our static object. So our static object is basically that uh, collider. So we're going to increase that. So when I now press play, uh, we should basically almost have like no colliding of the object. So that can be useful to play around with. So maybe you can do a bit less or a bit more if you want some of that colliding. So this looks pretty cool. So there are a lot of options you can play around with here. Like this is like almost like the bare minimum you would need to do a basic simulation. Um, you can, for example, here add more gravity. You can also have like a small wind blowing in here. Let's say if I look at my axis, for example, the Z axis, let's say there is five wind force here. Uh, then you see that there will be some wind force going in here. So just by filling in a value here, I by default have this wind force. Very quickly to do. Um, it's this this nodes or these nodes are actually built to do something faster. So there are a lot of like pre-built options here. Uh, so I'm gonna put that back to zero. Uh, we also have like the configuration node, which I did not uh, which I did not talk that much about. Uh, here we can define things like the mass, the thickness, uh, for example, pinning points. So if you don't want to fully simulate this, uh, we can, for example, press this handle. And then we should be able to select something. Uh, make sure you are in point mode. So I'm here in point, so it's number two. And when we select points, we then press enter to confirm. And now it should actually fill in a bunch of numbers. And when I press simulate, it will just like pin those here in the air. So those are not seen as like actually simulation parts. Um, 
also interesting to play around with is the stretching of the clot. So if I increase the stretching and play around with that, you can see that we have like some more stretching and nice wrinkles here being created here. So this looks pretty cool. So I can always like play around with settings. I can, if I don't like it, just go back to default settings. Um, there are a lot of things you can play around with. Uh, maybe one more thing I want to talk about here is um, uh, UVs, uh, because of course if you want to bring this in the game, you want to make sure uh, this is actually um, having some UV. Uh, so if I, right now, we do a flatten node, UV flatten, it will create like a very basic UV for my object. So there are multiple ways of doing UV, like you can use, for example, the the other unwrapping nodes, um, but yeah, it depends on on what you want. You, usually, UV flatten here is in this case pretty good. It works really well with uh, with like two D objects that doesn't have any closed geometry. So if I now would run my simulation again, uh, you can see that the UV will hold up pretty well. So we don't have to worry too much about doing a UV afterwards or something like that. It just works here as well. So that works pretty well. Um, then furthermore, if you want to play around with the setup, uh, we can plug in custom shapes. Let's say I want to have a box here. I want to have a box and I want to have uh, a ground plane. Just going to take a crit. And uh, if I merge those together, clean so let me simulate that so you can see that we have like this result so again if you want to load in something that you already made or for example you have like some assets from uh like from quixel or something quixel assets and you want to simulate cloud on that uh, you can again use the file node to um, load in a custom fbx file and then you can just plug it in over here in the collision Simulate cloud, and you're basically done. Doesn't require you much more work because you already set up the logic here. Uh, maybe one more thing, or the last thing to show here is, of course, uh, we also have a, a vellum brush or a cloud brush. So these cloud brushes were quite popular. Uh, so Houdini has one as well. Uh, if I type in uh, just brush, you should see vellum brushing. So this is something that, of course, uh, mainly only works in Houdini. It doesn't necessarily work in Game Engine, where you can just simply brush it. Um, so what I want to do here is I want to lock this node. So this solver is uh, time dependent. So whenever we change something here in time, you can see it will output something differently. So I want to lock the node in place. So we're going to press the locking icon. I will press OK. And whenever you do this, then you also need to make sure that like, this is not like procedurally anymore because we are locking it in place. Whatever I do with settings, if I play around with the settings here, it doesn't matter anymore because it's locked. It's fully locked down. It doesn't update anymore. It's just going to update this result. So the only reason why I do this is because now I can just quickly plug it in my brushing here. And with the brush, I can now do like manual tweaks. I can, for example, grab this clot and I can say like, yeah, maybe I need to push it like so a bit. So now I'm just, I'm not working fully really procedural anymore. I'm just doing some art direction or art control, but I'm like defining how my clot sh should really behave in the scene. So again, like most of the, the work here was done procedurally, but if I really want to like fine tune it, maybe you can just for example, with the, with the cloth brush, like tweak it a bit. Uh, we have like different modes here. Um, you can press one to six to have different modes. So we can have drag, uh, maybe the rotate could be nice, like rotating. Like so, yeah, this is just like to show you that this is possible. Uh, but if you really want to have like fully procedurally set up, then uh, it's not always useful because again, you're manually brushing things. 
Uh, so it's not winning procedurally when you do something manually. So now I'm going to calculate that here back again. So yeah, that was some basic uh, clots here. Uh, oh yeah, one more thing, you can also have a post-processing clot or vellum. You can plug it in over here. Um, this uh, can be useful if you want to blur or add more subdivisions. Uh, if you want to add more, uh, of course, be careful with this. Uh, you can also do a thickness here. If I enable thickness, I can give this a thickness. Um, oh yeah, also, of course, the poly reducer of Houdini. If you're not familiar with that, it's quite well known to have a nice reducer. So this is percentage reducing. Uh, I can see that this was just in real time. I can just quickly reduce those things. It holds pretty well. And also like still, like I have still that same good looking UV without any distortions going on, even if even I do like simulation and, and reducing, it still holds up the UV pretty well. So yeah, uh, I think that was it for this demo. Um, I see there is some other questions. Uh, so from Paul, uh, so how popular is this approach in content creation within the game industry? Um, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I've seen it a few times before. Uh, I've actually seen it more, uh, like specifically like this clot stuff and vellum. I've seen it actually more in movies and, and for motion graphics. It's very popular there as well. Uh, for games, I've seen it here and there to do all kinds of things. Like you could simulate clot, you could simulate uh, cables or lines, you could simulate hair. Um, it's it's uh, sometimes used. Yeah, it has some. Again, it's it's more for the the procedural approach. Like you can just quickly plug in another model. You can just you can also bring this inside of a game engine. Um, I actually use this for Project Titan as well, where you could just, inside of Unreal, do these cloud simulations without having to use Houdini. It's just in there in the background. Uh, so it's quite useful to, to have. Um... Do you need Houdini Engine as well for Unreal integration? Uh, yeah, Houdini Engine is the name for the plugin to use in Unreal or Unity or even older in, in, in Max and Maya as well. Um, so that's the, the name of the plugin. So of course, it's, it's not currently available with Apprentice. Um, if you are uh, teacher or student, there, is, there are also uh, educational versions where things are included as well. So we'll also in a moment I'll quickly show you for bringing this in a game engine. I uh, see that there might be some more questions, so I will m maybe wait a moment. Maybe I can start in real already. Yeah, I'm honestly really surprised by how responsive like the the clot is, like even when optimizing and like reducing the the poly count on it. Very impressive. Yeah, you can actually you can do the simulation and a poly reducer at the same time almost. It, it's just we calculate so fast. Oh damn. That's um, cool. Man. I need I need to I need to check this out. I need to take like a proper dive in. There's also one more question from uh, Scott Burns. 
He's asking, could you create a building generator like showed earlier in the workshop, but just generate in Houdini and then export the FBXs to Unreal Engine to get around like the limitations of the apprentice um, uh, license? Well, so the thing is with like the, the building generator, it's instancing models. Um, so it's not making new geometry, it's just instancing the models. Um, so in that terms, uh, you cannot do that with the apprentice. What you can do is, like you said, like you can make some sort of like building generator and export this as like a new mesh, uh, but then you're not instancing anything. And of course, um, instancing is something that is preferred with game engines. Mm -hmm. If you talk about larger worlds, um, and also especially, for example, with like the whole nanite thing, really uh, likes instancing. Yeah, so actually. I, for example, here have this clot tool already in game. This is actually for uh, a tutorial that will be released soon. Uh, so this is the same setup that I showed almost, uh, but this fully works here in game. So this is the default testing scene. I just say that this is my clot object, hit simulate, and then I have it here in game. And I can also do polish using, I can do a new thing, I can do everything that I want here. Um, so let's say I want to bring this pipe quickly in the game. So I'll quickly show you this. It will not take that long. So what we need to do often in Houdini is when I have a system that is very interesting, I want to collapse this into one node and save this for the future. Uh, so we're going to select, for example, these these nodes. I'm going to press uh, make. A sub network, so we are collapsing this in one node. I'm going to right click, I'm going to say make a digital asset. Then I can give this a name. I'm just going to call this demo uh, pipe. Uh, hopefully, I don't have a copy of that, so maybe I'm just going to give this number one. So I'm just going to click accept. So then we have this menu. Uh, this is where we're going to create a custom interface. So here we don't have any interfaces, so we can actually create a custom interface. Uh, very quickly showing you how to do that is, for example, I can grab uh, this first poly bevel. I can just grab the number uh, and I can just say uh, bevel amount and then press accept. So now I actually have a tool uh, with a slider bevel amount. Uh, I can, of course, make this menu bigger, do more stuff. Uh, but this is how you often would do things with Houdini. Is hey, I made something that's super interesting. I'm gonna save it into one single tool, a digital asset. Um, so I, I have, of course, I have my own digital asset. I have many of them. If I just type in game, I have like many random assets that I have for doing all kinds of things. Uh, so that is actually what makes, in my opinion, Houdini the most powerful. Is over time you create your own library and tools. That will benefit personally so much like if if you ever ask me like hey could you make a building or or a tree or this or that it might already be here available if i just type in tree i have some tree tools if i press uh house i have some house stuff there's just like a bunch of stuff that over time grows of course it's it's like your own library or if you work in studios it's, it's the company's library filled with tools um so once we have that here I'm going to go into game engine. Uh, I have Houdini engine installed. Uh, if you go to plugin, uh, installed plugins, I have Houdini engine. So again, you need a license for this. You either need uh, Houdini ND, uh, some form of educational license if you're with school, or uh, anything higher than that. So we are talking about the core or the FX licenses. Um, so yeah, so then you can install this plugin. The only thing left to do is to find that file locally. Let me see if I can get that here. Um, okay, so I'm going to just drag and drop it from my folder. And I just had the same tool. So it's just pipe demo one. Just going to drag it in here. Uh, it might take a moment to warm up because it's like the first time it needs to calculate. Uh, it has like this big logo. 
So that means that we need to conf configure it somehow. Um, so what I need to do is the tool is expecting a curve as input and currently it doesn't have any input. So inputs is actually set to none. Uh, so we need to switch this to curve. And now I actually have the same tool that I had um, in, uh, in Houdini. So it's the exact same uh, tool. And also with that one single slider to just increase the bevel amount. Uh, so you can see like, if you are familiar with these workflows, it really like, takes like a minute to just test out. Uh, this of course is like a very simple tool to just implement and show here. If we really talk about the larger tool to generate worlds, to generate buildings, then there are all of aspects to, um, to make sure that everything is working because now you're doing something basic. So I almost know that, that it would be working. So yeah, so that's how you could, for example, quickly bring this into Unreal. So yeah, so that was it for, for like this workshop. Uh, yeah, I hope you learn a few things here and there. If there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Simon, for taking the time to share this amazing workshop for us at Beyond Extent. Make sure to check out Simon's work in the description below. Also, a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. These workshops are funded because of your support. If you want to participate in these workshops live, are looking to grow your skills as an environment artist, or just want to be part of an exciting community filled with them, then head on over to beyondextent.com where you can find all the tools you need to help you and grow you on your journey as an environment artist. I'll see you there.